Hello, fellow risk takers, and welcome to my worst investment ever. Stories of loss to keep you winning. In our community, we know that to win in investing, you must take risk, but to win big, you've got to reduce it. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm on a mission to help 1 million people reduce risk in their lives. To reduce risk in your life, pause this episode right now and go to myworstinvestmentever.com and take the risk reduction assessment that I've created from the lessons I've learned from more than 470 guests. It's time you start building wealth the easy way by reducing risk. Fellow risk takers, this is your worst podcast host, Andrew Stotts from A. Stotts Academy, and I'm here with featured guest, Adrian Chu. Adrian, are you ready to join our mission? I was born ready. Come, let's rock and roll. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I really, I can feel that from our conversation we had before we turned on the mic. I just love the energy that you bring to the world. So let me introduce you to the audience. Adrian Chu is the one and only career strategist in Asia and is the founder of Career Agility International. In three years, he has helped more than 1,000 clients successfully achieve clarity to enjoy a happier and even more successful career. Adrian, take a minute and tell us a bit about the value you bring to the world. Well, on a professional level, I, one of the things I really enjoy doing is I love sitting down with senior executives who are trying to figure out what to do next with their life, what to do next with their career, and you know, sitting down, understanding what they need, what they want, and how to move ahead. Uh, we help to unlock their vision for the future uh, via their careers. And once they get career clarity, you can see the amount of confidence and, and happiness they have. And we help them along that journey to be better and more successful. And that's one of the things which, which really drives me. And I believe that that's something that keeps me uh, going all the time. Mm. You know, it's interesting when we think about, let's say, building a house or making a garden or doing some project, we oftentimes map it out, we make a plan and all of that. But when it comes to careers, I think, why is it that people just don't often have a plan? Maybe they have some ideas in their head, but they don't have a clear strategy of where they're going. I wonder why that is. Well, there are two reasons, basically. I think the first reason is for the longest time, companies have taken care of the careers of many of the executives. And unfortunately, as we know in this day and age, that's no longer true. But a lot of executives are still holding on to that version 1.0 careers thinking where my company is going to take care of me, my boss loves me, but you know that's not true. But the second thing which is more interesting, which we see happening is that a lot of people are more focused on their jobs rather than their careers. So they're looking at next quarter's KPIs, uh, what are the targets, you know, am I above, am I below? And they are so focused on it, they lose track of their careers. And one day, you know, they realize that, wait a minute, I'm, I'm in the, I'm in the, print industry and no one's reading newspapers anymore, you know, why am I still doing this? So we always advise you need to take a step back from your job and look at your career and not just in terms of your career, but how does your career fit in your entire life strategy? And it's a big picture thing everyone needs to take a pause and look at. Yeah, I mean, that's something that I know all the listeners can benefit from. It's just taking a pause and uh, I think it, you put things into perspective. Mm -hmm. And um, where is it that people can find you and what's the best way to kind of follow what you're doing and the journey that you're on? Well, you can find out, <clears throat> so you can find out more about me on uh, www.careeragility.org or uh, you can just drop me an email at info at careeragility.org uh, with uh, any career questions you might have. We're always Great. happy to uh, ans answer any questions. So we'll have those links in the show notes and that's exciting. I know in my career, there was a time when I had achieved, I had been voted number one analyst in Thailand in 2007 and 2008. And then it was like, I knew at that time that I wanted to have my own business. And mm -hmm. so I started shifting. I actually changed jobs and went to a company that most people were kind of surprised I went to, but I went mm -hmm. there because I knew it gave me a chance to try to develop what I wanted to develop mm, um, nice. and to then create that new job, which is the business that I run right now. So. That, that strategy, I like the word strategist, so that's awesome. Well, now it's time to share your worst investment ever. And since no <laughs> one goes into their worst investment thinking it will be, take uh, tell us a bit about the circumstances oh. leading up to then tell us your story. 
Well, it was back in 2000 and I uh, wouldn't really call it my worst investment, but it was something which a uh, journey I had to go on. And I always wanted to be an entrepreneur. In fact, I was an entrepreneur back in, uh, in, in university. I started a business selling real human skeletons to medical students just to pay my way through uni. But, uh, you know, and when I started my first couple of years in Shell, and I decided I wanted at a, at a right young age of 30, I wanted to start my own business again. So I... We sat down with friends and we brainstormed and we started a company doing electronic marketing. Okay, this was back in 2000 during the dot-com days. We got funded, we ran it and uh, lots of groundbreaking technologies which, which we engineered, which I engineered uh, from electronic marketing to data analytics to uh, lifestyle marketing. And it was interesting because uh, we ran it for three years. Uh, we were successful at first, but we had difficulty scaling it. And at the end of it, no, we decided that, uh, well, it's, it's, if you can't scale it, it's not going to work. And we decided to, to call it a day and, and go our separate ways. But one of the interesting things that I've learned uh, from that so-called failure is uh, if, you, if you notice, I was saying that it's, it's all the interesting stuff which we are doing today, but back in 2000. So you know, a lot of people say about first mover advantage. Uh, it's just actually a first mover this advantage sometimes. So one of, one of the lessons I've learned is the old saying that, you no, know, they say the early bird gets the worm. Sometimes it isn't true. It's the, the second mouse gets the cheese. So, so uh, yeah, so it didn't work out. And it was, it was a long, I spent three years building the business and uh, it was longer than I should have stuck around, honestly. Mm. Yeah, I always think of the, the early bird gets the worm, but what about the early worm? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Too bad for him. Yeah. He gets chomped up. So, so, so it, it, it was a painful lesson. Let, let's talk about it just for a moment because you seem like a guy that's going to bring a lot of passion and energy into something that you do. And I can imagine between your friends and yourself that you were really on track with some amazing stuff, some early successes. When was the moment that you realized this isn't going to be able to scale? Okay. Uh, it was interesting because we were having very good traction in the market, uh, in the Singapore market. And uh, we were targeting lifestyle services to young couples. And, you know, every year uh, about close to 20,000 couples got married and uh, we, we wrapped it up uh, along, along the lines of uh, electronic marketing, of, of bridal services, wedding services, uh, insurance and everything. And, and we were selling lots of stuff lots of services and products into this particular group which was, which was very engaged okay so it's, it's membership marketing and it was good but when we did the numbers we realized that it was not large enough to support a bigger business and we had to go regional but uh, the biggest moment which I got a big aha moment that it was not going to work out was when we started uh, turning up numbers and we said look uh, we, we can't grow and if we want to grow we need to go regional which means that we need to plump in plonk in a lot of money into it and I guess at age 32 back then I wasn't quite ready for it yet mm. yeah and uh, I decided that uh, there was a lot more opportunity cost for me going back into the corporate world so I spent three years out on my own uh, in, in the wilderness in the wild of uh, in the wild wild west of entrepreneurship and then I decided now nah, maybe the timing wasn't quite right for me at the time so I decided mm. okay back to corporate yep and that's a, you know, a valuable lesson for the listeners out there. I know plenty of people who are struggling to set up their own business and do their own thing. And scaling is really, really an issue. And most people go in and they're like, no, no, it'll be okay. I'll get my customers and you know, I'll figure it out. <laughs> but the truth is, is that you know, without the ability to scale, you just have yeah. a, a hobby. So what lessons did you learn from this experience? Well, quite a number of lessons. Number one, as I said earlier, don't be... Don't... Don't be the first, don't, don't be the early, but it's, sometimes it's just tough. By the time, you know, we educated the market, we improve our technologies and everything. And we were working with technologies that weren't even ready yet. So we had to construct our own. Uh, but uh, by the time we did it, you know, the, the market caught on and competitors jumped on the bandwagon. So it was a bit difficult. But one of the bigger lessons I've learned is, um, I mean, there were lots of lessons which I learned. One of the bigger lessons I learned is, um, you don't go into business just because you want to be in business. You really need to have the domain expertise, the very solid business foundation, business idea, and then you go into business. You don't just wake up one morning and go, I want to do it. Let's, let's drop everything and do it. Uh, I'm a big fan of Mark Cuban, uh, Shark Tank. Mm. Yep. 
And, and he has a name for people like this. Uh, he loves them. He loves entrepreneurs. Okay. He's a big entrepreneur himself. Uh, he has a term for it. He calls these guys one, one entrepreneurs. People who don't have a business idea, but they're trying, okay, but I want to be because it's so glamorous. I, I was born for this and he went out, he did it. So uh, he says, you're going to make a distinction between being an entrepreneur with a service or product you can sell or being a one entrepreneur. I'll go business, businessman. Let me see what can I sell here. Hey, you know, a better mousetrap. So one of the lessons I learned is you really need to get into a zone, understand the market, and then you go out and become an entrepreneur, not the other way around. Mm-hmm. And um, maybe I'll, I'll summarize some of the things that I took away from it. I mean, I, one thing I realized, uh, and I didn't know it when I was young, is that entrepreneurship is a trap ultimately because you're going to go in and it's not, it, I mean, unless you're like the super lucky one, it's going to go harder than you thought. It's going to take longer than you thought. It's going to take yes. more money than you thought. Yes. And, and it really becomes this long game. And I think for many people, the emotional journey of that for themselves and maybe their family is more than what they bargained for. And that's probably a reason why plenty of them stop. It's like, this is beyond yeah. what I thought. So the first thing it kind of reminded me is that, you know, when you go into entrepreneurship, you know, be prepared. You could be de- dedicating the next five or 10 or years of your life or maybe even your lifetime. I look at one of our startups about 26 years ago, our coffee business in Thailand called Coffee Uh Works. And my business partner and I just had dinner last night, but he's been running it for 26 years. And Mm -hmm. it has become, you know, it is ultimately his life. The second thing is, you know, I I thought about, I wrote down on a whim. You know, many people start a business on a whim, like, oh yeah, this would be a great idea. And, you know, I just feel really sorry for that because it's going to crash. Yeah. But you see it all the time. And I think Michael Gerber said it very well in his book, uh, The E-Myth. He called it the entrepreneurial seizure. So you just get so excited about your idea. You just get into it, right? Yeah. Yeah. And the last thing that I, I like to say when people are getting into business is that you have to set a goal to get to 3 to $5 million in revenue as fast as possible, let's say within three years. Why 3 to $5 million? Because three to five million dollars is enough money to cover the overhead of running a real business. You got to have a marketing sales manager. You've got to have a manager of the business. You can't do everything yourself. You've got to have all the different people in the business that are managers, number one. So to have a management team, it takes real money. And the second thing is that um, the infrastructure, you know, you want to have an ERP system. You want to have all the communication, the software, it's not cheap. And so when you get to, so the idea is really forget about hobby. If you're going to get serious, you got to get to three to five million or else you are just going to drive yourself into the ground. Exactly. And you know, once again, it boils back down to scalability because, and it's a chicken and the egg because you want to be able to scale your operations uh, and in order to scale your operations and revenue, you need, you need to scale your people as well. Mm. In order to support the scalability of people, you need to scale your revenues up again, right? So, so unless you're, you're really blessed to be like one of those mega unicorns where you have billion dollar investors who don't care whether you have an ROI or not, you know, then you just keep spending money. But most of us in the entrepreneurs, <laughs> they're in the real world, you know, uh, hey, it's, it's, it's a different ballgame altogether. So yeah. once again, it's just a balance. So based upon what you learned from this story and what you continue to learn, what one action would you recommend our listeners take to avoid suffering the same fate? Mm. Think of that man or woman out there who's listening who is just about to dive in and you may have some fantastic one piece of advice for them. Actually, I got two pieces of advice. One is, uh, you know, sometimes you, you have to learn from your mistakes. And sometimes in order to do that, you've got to make mistakes. So, you know, uh, that three years in a while in, 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 in my journey in the desert, so to speak, uh, has made me a better entrepreneur, entrepreneur now. That's why uh, I'm not repeating the mistakes which I did before. And that's why Career Agility International, we are, we are doing really well and we're growing very well. Mm-hmm. So uh, you got to make the mistakes in order to learn from the mistakes. But on the flip side to it, the other piece of advice is you can learn from other people's mistakes as well. You know, like that's what this channel is about, isn't it? Exactly. <laughs> exactly, right? So that's why that's the, the big reason why uh, you should listen to, to this channel. And uh, Andrew, you know, he's the number one guy when it comes to who, being the worst. So yes. <laughs> yes. I'm, I'm man on that. You're the bad, yeah. But, but I, one, one, one interesting piece of advice for entrepreneurs, okay, is uh, mm. if you really want to go into business and be an entrepreneur yourself, 
I would recommend that no, no, not get an MBA. Okay, uh, mm. I would recommend you go watch all seven seasons of Shark Tank, the American version. Okay, there's so many lessons you can learn from the sharks there, uh, and you look at the business models, you look at the questions which they throw to the individuals, to the entrepreneurs, and you go like, yeah, sharks. Oh, there goes my business idea. I can't answer that. The, oh, that you mean that's an issue? Oh, to me, that has taught me a lot more about entrepreneurship and being a better entrepreneur than actually my, my business school degree. So yeah, that's great advice. Yeah, it reminds, shark tank. Yeah, it reminds me, we have somewhat of a shark tank competition here called the Bangkok Business Challenge at Sassan oh, University. Wow. And I've been a judge in it for maybe about 10 years. And it's, 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 it's on TV, it's published, uh, you know, it's, it's live for the finalist teams. And I've always been a finalist judge. So last year, I had some interns working with me and I said, let's find those videos and let's cut out the questions and then try to create a presentation around the questions. Mm. So I created a, uh, a presentation called Get Funded. And oh, wow. really, it's just all about these are 30 questions that you must have an answer to. And here's how you should do it. And mm. so uh, I haven't really published that one yet, but uh, I'm, I'm getting close. So it makes me think about studying the past watching those videos marking things down very yeah. valuable advice now i'm looking i'm looking forward to that yeah that's going to be fun to get out so what is one resource that you'd recommend to the listeners that they could benefit from mm, i would say uh, back to back to what i was mentioning about shark tank <laughs> you just watch all seven seasons yep. okay with an open mind uh, but uh, I would say, you know, go listen, listen to this channel. I mean, uh, with, with, with Andrew, you know, yourself, you've been a great uh, catalyst in the, in the movement where you, you, you learn from other people's mistakes so that you don't repeat them, you know, and it's, and it's free, free advice, yeah, good exactly. advice, you know, and, and, and like, like what, one of the things, uh, one of my, my angel investor during that period of uh, the business, three years in the business. Or oh, I still remember the last day when we shut the operations down. Uh, she said, no, Adrian, it's, it's not a failure. It's not a loss. After all, it's only money. Make sure that you learn uh, the lessons here and carry them forward in your life ahead so that when you finally, the time is finally right for you to rise and, and grab that, that, that brass ring, okay? Mm. You're going to do it right. Yep. Because what, all the mistakes you've done it before, you're a better person, you're a smarter person, just bring it along. So, you know, uh, feel free to make mistakes. Feel free to learn from other people's mistakes like mine mm. and uh, get better at what you do. Fantastic. I like the quote from Otto von Bismarck. He says, only a fool learns from his mistakes. The wise man learns from the mistakes of others. Uh, Last brilliant. question. What's your number one goal for the next 12 months? Well, we want to help another thousand people in the coming year ahead. I mean, we've, we've helped many people, but we are scaling our operations and mm. uh, we want to help them in terms of getting more career clarity and getting to enjoy and refocus their lives around their careers, but not just about careers, but everything else that's important to them and, yep. uh, and just, get, just, just enjoy themselves uh, working rather than being slave to the job. Well, listeners, if, if you need that help, you know where to go. Just go to the show notes and I'll have all the links so you can follow Adrian and get to know what he's doing. Well, listeners, there you have it. Another story of loss to keep you winning. If you haven't taken the risk reduction assessment, I challenge you right now to go to myworstinvestmentever.com and start building wealth the easy way by reducing risk. As we conclude, Adrian, I want to thank you again for joining our mission. And on behalf of A. Stotts Academy, I hereby award you alumni status for turning your worst investment ever into your best teaching moment. Do you have any parting words for the audience? <laughs> Stay tuned to Andrew Stoltz. He, he knows his stuff. So uh, learn a lot from him. He's the best. All the worst. Yes. And, that, <laughs> and that's a wrap on another great story to help us create, grow, and protect our wealth. Remember, ladies and gentlemen, this podcast is about one guest, one story one mission to help 1 million people reduce risk in their lives. Fellow risk takers, this is your worst podcast host, Andrew Stott, saying, I'll see you on the upside.